Hi, this is Tommy Newberry. Welcome back to Achieving Optimal. In this special episode, it's really it's part two of my conversation with clinical psychologist, Dr. Mark Crawford. It's recorded live up at Barnsley Resort in North Georgia during our recent couples planning retreat. This is the second segment, the second half of that conversation. So if you haven't listened to the first half, I want you to go back and listen to that first and then come back to this. But in these two episodes, we talk about getting on the same page with your spouse. It's not always easy to do. Goal setting and the science of marriage. I think you're really, really going to enjoy it. Of course, if you listened to the first half already, you know that. So let's go straight to the second half right now. So a number of questions had to do with accountability and uh, whether to select your spouse as your accountability partner. Yeah, that's a real <laughs> quick no from both of us. Here. No. Uh, that's not what you want. Right? We're not yeah. even going to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. You, first of all, your, your spouse is a awesome indirect accountability partner. You know, with, without having to have anything formal, you're going to get sharpened, encouraged, challenged by the person that you're married to. But as far as actually having an accountability partner, which is a great idea, um, you need to pick somebody that is not your spouse, preferably somebody that is on the same page with you from a value standpoint, somebody you respect and admire, and somebody who's willing to invest in you. So it could be somebody that's in your same phase of life. Uh, it could be somebody who doubles as a mentor. They're a little bit further ahead of you. You could find an accountability partner for the principles we've talked about this weekend. You could maybe find an accountability partner here or with somebody that you bring now or intend to bring in the future or something like that. But the main thing is that you respect, you ha you respect and trust this person and they have, they, they have that same uh, significance in your life so that you give them permission to look under the hood and ask you tough questions about what's going on in the relationship, um, what's going on in your finances, um, what actions have you been taken. Uh, and so you could even expand it to a group of people that get together on a regular basis. Uh, in my normal coaching practice, clients that, that have an accountability partner that they connect with once a week seems to be the magic formula. Um, they don't have to be in person, but they pre-design some questions um, and they get on the phone every week, sometimes in person, and it's a 15 minute phone call and they pre-agree to ask questions such as, hey, uh, Tommy, what have you done uh, in the last week to make Kristen feel loved and cared about? When was, your la when, when was your last date night and when is your next one scheduled? In other words, if I had your family coach in front of me, family coach for him or her, if I had it in front of me, I could ask you some great questions. And basically a, a strong accountability partner is somebody that you have a bond with, but also somebody that is just good at asking questions or is willing to ask you the questions. And then when you, you go, um, well, Tommy, uh, when was your last workout or how are you doing with your fitness? If you ask a question like, hey, how are you doing with the relationship? Or how are you doing with fitness? I go, oh, good, good. No value. <laughs> in other words, everybody in this room is articulate enough, quick thinking enough that they can deflect a question like that. So the importance is, hey, what have you done? You know, when was your last workout? You know, when, is your, when did you schedule your next date night? And it needs to be all focused on what you can do to be a stronger spouse not, you know, obviously pointing out uh, deficiencies in your husband or wife. But it's very important because accountability helps us break through. Another, we have a human nature. We all are human in here. We all have a tendency to drift. We all have a tendency to maybe uh, live underneath our potential. But an accountability partner, by asking you the questions, helps lift you up. It helps be an antidote to the worst aspects of human nature and a little bit of accountability is better than no accountability at all. So I encourage you if you really want a, some lighter fluid on the, the principles from this weekend is to find somebody 
who can ask you the tough questions, uh, but I wouldn't at all recommend that you do that with your spouse. If you each had accountability partners, that'd be awesome. Yeah. You Any just more want to thoughts avoid, on accountability? Uh, avoiding, you know, w when you talk about having my spouse as my accountability partner, then you get into that parent-child dynamic. You don't want to ever have a parentified role in a relationship, you know, which, which is where I'm going to tell you what you can and can't do and, and should and shouldn't do. That really begins to drift away from intimacy and partnership and, 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 and equality, which is really where we, we do our best is when I married a partner, not a parent, right? Yeah. So as we're thinking about how to execute over the next 12 months, uh, one of the questions that came up a couple of different ways is how do we stay on track? How do we get organized and stay on track? Because we, we gave you a lot of options, right? Lots of things that you could do. We're not expecting you to do everything. So let me share a few ideas. And then after we're done, I'm going to come back and and show you a little bit more. We'll put the screen down and I'll, I'll cover some additional items. But the first thing after leaving here is to set up a time to revisit. So maybe you have a week from today, you're gonna to revisit for 15 minutes. Uh, on the car ride home, you want to uh, follow through or on the flight home, you want to follow through on the unfinished business from the weekend. That's just to get the momentum going. Then the uh, once a week, the, act the best thing you can do to stay on track is to have a, an assessment or a timeout for yourself once a week and, and evaluate what's gone well in the last seven days. If you're a wife, what, hey, what's gone well in the last seven days in my role? What hasn't gone so well? If I could have a do-over for the next week, what would I change? Same thing for the husband. And how long might that take? I mean, just less than 15 minutes. I mean, 15 minutes would be your really doing an in-depth job. And then once a quarter, I recommend that you have a dinner. So in April, I recommend that you either have a, a getaway, you know, on your own for a weekend, for a night, or the most easy, the easiest thing to execute is to, to have a dinner. You know, go somewhere where you can spend a couple hours, have a great dinner, pick a place where you'll have some room to maybe bring the family coach, and, and just go over it what, and focus on the three questions. What's worked, what hasn't worked so well, and what are one or two things we're gonna tweak? Just very objectively, what do we want to do better? Because it's those questions that, that I see kind of programming you to make better choices, or what I used the word yesterday, better micro choices in the next week. If you never evaluate yourself then we have a tendency to just engage in the same behaviors over and over again. So as soon as in the next week, we're going to start helping you with that process of staying on track. Um, maybe, I don't think it was maybe 10 years of doing the retreats and we kind of start asking people for feedback. You know, what do you like? What worked? What do we do too much of? What do we not do enough of? And that kind of thing. And they said, golly, for January, February, March, and part of April, we were just so gung-ho. And then as the school year kind of came to an end, and then we got into summer, by the time fall came around, we were so off track. If we could do something to extend the value of it, because you're going to come out of here with like a, a post-convention bounce. You know, you're going to have a lot of enthusiasm, you'll be excited, but the real world's going to hit you. So we're going to give you something at certain increments, the monthly, um, I've got a picture of it I'll show you in a minute, then quarterly, and then we'll be shooting you text on a weekly basis that just remind you. I might send something that says, hey, what's the most valuable use of your time right now? Or what could you do to go to the extra mile with your wife this weekend? Um, what could you do that's fun? When is your next em etch memory plan? Just a little bit, little bit, little bit. Um, some of you that are in here got those over the last year, but the, the main way to stay on track is to revisit this weekend repeatedly. So I hope that helps. Uh, one of the questions was dealing with overwhelm relative to that and um, not just overwhelm in following through on your goals, but how do we apply the, how do we stay uh, or how do we support our spouse if our spouse is overwhelmed 
uh, from work and home and is wanting to be a great mom, let's say, wanting to be a great wife, but also has all these work responsibilities and it just seems too much. Mm -hmm. How as a spouse can we support the other spouse who, who seems overwhelmed? Well, I think that's going to get back to what we talked about with attunement. And, and again, the in couples who do well, they, they invest in understanding the feelings, the struggles, the experiences of their, of their spouse. So the first thing that, that I find people doing is I need to fix that, right? Uh, okay, you're over under, uh, so they take the responsibility, I need to make that better. You may not be able to. But what's important is that you feel, if I feel I'm overwhelmed and Dana really, A, understands and has worked to understand and cares, that's helpful in and of itself. But we oftentimes undervalue the importance of just having someone who empathically is there and present and listens and is concerned. I don't expect her to fix it, but it's good that I'm not carrying it alone. So, you know, depending upon what the causes are, um, I think the first step is what we talked about, which people skip, is just being willing to work to understand, listen, and care. Yeah, and there's a couple of questions that uh, one of my mentors shared with me, very simple questions, but, you know, ask, you know, ask. Mm -hmm. Just instead of trying to guess how you can support, how could I support you better? Mm -hmm. um, and then another one that's uh, is good or better is, how, how could I pray for you this week? You know, great questions to find out, you know, what's going on in the inner life and addressing that you know, by offering support, but also from a spiritual standpoint. Um, an another interesting question kind of came from the overwhelm, wasn't exactly, was what if, what if one spouse or the other is interested in working on the relationship, mm -hmm. but not both? Mm -hmm. what, how do we approach that? So I think um, in any relationship, you've got two individuals. And, and the only thing that I can do in my marriage is what I can do. And if I'm doing that to the best I can, then, then that's all I can, I can basically do. What, what I would say is, I, I see this in couples, if, if you're not going to do it, then it lets me off the hook. Well, not really, right? We're, we're accountable for our behavior in our relationship with anybody in our life. And the one dynamic that I try to get people to avoid because it really is destructive is I need to change you, right? Uh, the, the extent to which a person is trying to change their spouse, it takes away from all the other things you need to be focused on. And that's where it can get nasty, nasty pretty quickly. Um, so I think it's, if, if the, the question is, I'm on board, I want to work on these things, but I really don't see my spouse being all that into it okay, you keep doing it. And it's, it could be that, that you inspire the, the other person. See, it's like, it's like working out. I, I've known couples where somebody is really into fitness and the other one's like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. But they see the benefits that that spouse who's going to the gym every day and working out is experiencing and they're inspired to make changes. Once again, change is usually inspired rather than coerced or threatened or forced. So I would say don't, don't spend your energy trying to get your spouse to change that necessarily. Just do it to the best of your ability. Yeah, and the phrase I like to use is focus on the controllables. Control the controllables. You can't, you shouldn't be trying to, and even if you try to, you're not going to succeed in controlling your spouse. I have found great success from one couple, one, one, in, one spouse uh, using goal setting, um, pausing every week to evaluate their progress. And the other spouse is, has great intentions. They're just kind of not into the goal setting as much. They, they like the inspiration, that kind of thing. That, is that optimal? It's probably not optimal, but one person can make a huge difference because if you've got, you know, think of it as in a business relationship, you've got two people and if neither one of them are thinking proactively or intentionally, that's a real problem. You'd like to have both of them that are equally interested in thinking about their goals, staying on track and that kind of thing. But if at least one of them is mindful of those things, and then as Mark said, is setting the great example, that's powerful. And I would second and third what he said. I've seen that for years and years and years because it's a, a common question of, of how do I get my spouse equally engaged? And, and the only way that I've ever known to work is to engage at the highest level yourself with your mouth shut. 
And when you do that, you start to set a great example and the other person gets curious or they get influenced, which I think is a, the opposite of the word that you use, coerced. Mm -hmm. So influence comes through example. And so do not be discouraged. I mean, it's probably very likely that one of the two of you is more excited about what we've covered this weekend than the other. Don't stress out about that, depending on either, whether, which, whichever spouse you are, don't stress out about it. That's fine. That's good. Isn't it kind of like a lot of other things? You're, you're not exactly equal in your enthusiasm level for all aspects of the relationship. Yeah, people see that as maybe a problem, but it's really normal. Yeah, yeah. It's just normal. So I brought up prayer a minute ago in, you know, asking your spouse, mate, hey, how can I pray for you? Is there, is there any... Do we have any information or any research on prayer and relationships or marriage? You know, there may be some out there. I'm just not familiar with it. I know there's research on prayer. You and I talked about in health and healing and things like that. The one thing I would say about that is um, if both people in a relationship want that, I, I just frankly can't see a downside to it at all. I think it can only be a positive thing. But having the, I've worked with enough couples, some people they're not that comfortable praying with another person, even their spouse. And, and I think that's where you don't want to make that feel wrong because yeah. I've seen that as, as well, right? I mean, again, we're all individuals and, and I think our relationship to God is individualistic. So I, wouldn't, I, I, would, I would not want someone to say, he won't pray with me, therefore, you know, uh, there's something wrong. That may not be um, something wrong. It just may be a comfort level that they're not at yet. And I would be okay with that. I wouldn't want to make somebody feel badly about that. Yeah. And I've had a lot of clients that have, have really created a great dynamic. Uh, one person is the one that likes to pray mm -hmm. and the other person just kind of doesn't want to be as assertive or as visible, but they'll pray with them. Mm -hmm. And um, other couples who have been here, for example, have just committed to praying for each other kind of in their own way at their own time. And then other couples have actually prayed together silently. Mm -hmm. You know, like instead of being together and praying aloud or something like that, praying for each other. They, I've had clients that have prayed kind of using each other's uh, plans and goals and looking at them and just praying like that. One thing that I saw in a skit one time that was pretty funny was, you know, uh, a couple praying aloud, you know, asking God to fix their spouse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I we do not recommend that either. Um, but what is great is, and I believe this has a it's a spiritual concept, but I believe it has a powerful psychological concept. Is to thank if you if you're one to pray, um, is to thank God emphatically, whether you feel like it or not, for all the positive qualities that your intellect tells you that you're 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 married to. In other words, on the good days and the bad days, just being a keep yourself, try to cultivate a constant state of gratitude connected to God in your prayer life about your spouse. And I believe that affects the, the positive or negative sentiment override when you're constantly in that state of gratitude. More commonly, what I'm seeing often is couples who, you know, they'll meet sort of in a, in a very similar place spiritually. But over 10 or 20 years, they will drift in different directions on that. And I've seen some couples where it becomes more important to them and some where it doesn't become important, it becomes less important, or they abandon it altogether. But they can still be extraordinary spouses to one another because they have mutual respect and they, um, they, they allow for that and they, they make room in the relationship for those differences. So again, I think, it, yeah, wouldn't it be great if we're always sinking at the same place in all of these areas? But very often we don't. And when we don't, that doesn't have to be a negative impact on the relationship if you have mutual respect and tolerance and appreciation for, for your spouse. So what have, we haven't talked about money and budgeting, but what are, before we get into either one of those, um, and we'll kind of have to pull it to a close here in a minute, but what are what are the two major broad categories that cause divorce or that are stated as the main causes of divorce in general yeah, yeah. like concerns or issues i mean is um, there is it money issues is it faithfulness issues is it just people that believe they're incompatible with one another yeah so so as we said um a couple of days ago it, 
there really is no difference between couples who stay married and couples who don't in terms of the types of problems or even the severity of problems. It really isn't. It's about how they manage those problems and those conflicts. So I, I would hesitate to say there's you know, one incompatibility factor that, that is more likely. What we do know from the data is contemptuous behavior is the biggest predictor of divorce. When one person behaves contemptu contemptuously toward their partner routinely, that's going to have a bad outcome if it doesn't change. And that could be about anything. It could be about their parenting styles, money, anything, you know? Yeah, when we get outside the realm of marriage and just kind of talk about success in general, maximizing your full potential, being a winner, if you will, in life, uh, there, I, there's, a, there's a concept which is, which is clearly true, is there's a lot of things that successful people do that they don't like doing. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're the exact same things that lesser successful people don't like doing either. The difference is the successful people do them anyway, and the unsuccessful people are focused on the process, and they don't like the process, and so they don't follow through on it. And it kind of reminds me of, I think if you don't know better, if you're a little bit ignorant, then you, you're thinking that you're having these recurring issues, or you've got this dynamic, and it doesn't feel right, that this must mean something sinister or happy couples don't have this. And what you're saying is actually happy couples have that. They just deal with it better than unhappy couples. That is, if we have a second, can I read? Yeah, please do. So I mentioned earlier, you know, Dan Weil says, if you marry someone, you marry a set of problems. This may be one of my favorite quotes of his, and I'm gonna read it. It's just, it's a short little vignette, but it explains that concept. And I think, uh, well, this is what he means. So here's what he says. Paul married Alice, who tends to get loud at parties. Paul, who is shy, hates that. But if Paul had married Susan, he and Susan would have gotten into a fight before they even got to the party. That's because Paul's always late and Susan hates to be kept waiting. She would have felt taken for granted, which she's very sensitive about. Paul would have seen her complaining about this as an attempt to dominate him, which he's very sensitive about. Now, if Paul had married Gail, they wouldn't have even gone to the party because they'd still be upset about an argument they had the day before about Paul's not helping with the housework. This lack of help would have made Gail feel abandoned, which she's very sensitive about, and Paul will have interpreted Gail's complaining as an attempt at domination. The same's true about Alice. If she'd married Steve, she would have had the opposite problem because Steve gets drunk at parties, and Alice would have been so angry about his drinking, they would have gotten into a fight about it. Now, if she'd married Lou, she and Lou would have enjoyed the party. The trouble would have began after they got home because Lou wanted to have sex every time he wants to feel close, whereas Alice only wants sex when she already feels close. So he summarizes this by saying, I love that vignette, there's value when choosing a long-term partner and realizing you will inevitably be choosing a particular set of unsolvable problems and you'll be grappling with these for the next 10, 20, or 50 years. Now that sounds almost like, oh, but it's not. It's like, oh, okay. So it's just, what are the problems we're going to be sort of working through? And can we do it with mutual respect and affection and humor and tolerance and commitment? That's the key difference between couples who get divorced and couples who don't. Some couples stay together and they flourish and thrive. But if another couple has the same problems, it'll end up splitting them up because they don't have the tools to do what we've talked about this weekend. So... So is that, um, is the, is it almost like saying if somebody, you know, if they, if they get a different spouse, they haven't, it was, it was, is that, am I remembering something you yeah. said? They've, they've just exchanged yeah. uh, their spouse for a different set of problems, something That's like exactly that? That's exactly right, right. The grass is not greener, you know, in, in, in marriage necessarily. Now, 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 listen, obviously, you know, you, you can't be in a relationship where you feel uh, uh, physically unsafe or... There are deal breakers, and I, I acknowledge that, and I completely understand that. What we're talking about, though, is busting the myth that if I find the right person, we won't have issues, okay? Because there's no, that's a unicorn, I mean, that just doesn't exist, and that, that's his point. And the, the key is having the tools to say, we can work through this, we can make room in our relationship for this. This doesn't have to cause us to become adversarial or to not respect each other or to not care about each other. That's really yeah. the point. Yeah. Well, let me wrap it up. I had a number of you ask about the bedtime routine that I referenced uh, with my boys when they were younger. Um, and you, you just kind of have to adapt it to your personal style, but 
this started when Ty and Mason were, Ty was five, four or five, and, and Mason was around three. And then it, it evolved over time as they got older and I kind of made it more age appropriate. But the first thing that we would do, um, and I actually created a little resource for it, and it was called um, uh, 40 Days to a Self-Confident Kid. And I was, my, my son Ty was, uh, was working on overcoming dyslexia and auditory processing issues and things like that. And so he was constantly getting uh, criticized, uh, not, not in an intentional way, but in, in the class because he wasn't understanding things and it was more challenging and the other kids were moving ahead. So I picked up on that and thought, okay, I've got to do something in the evening to counteract what's happening during the day until we're able to mitigate somehow the dyslexia and the auditory processing. And so we started a routine where I would kind of interview him. I'd get him uh, tucked into bed and I'd ask him, I'd say, hey, let's talk about some things, uh, some victories from today. What were some discoveries? What were some accomplishments? What was some praise you got? Uh, did you uh, do something well that you got recognize for and I you know I would I would speak at an age that was appropriate um, and I think I, it was just achievements victories encouragements and praise something like that and he would answer those questions and I said would say well how does that make you feel and and I did that uh, not to be a kind of a touchy-feely exercise but to make him dwell on it a little bit more because the we feel what we dwell upon and so if you just think something that's that's healthier or positive or productive that's good but to kind of ruminate upon it or lose yourself in it marinate in it that's really what um, seems to have a positive effect so then the next thing i would do is i'd say what's a cool goal or fun idea for tomorrow so i use the word goal but i i kind of soften it by saying fun idea for tomorrow something you'd like to do tomorrow and um, and I was writing this down. So I, I was keeping a log of this. It, it was real easy. It, it was maybe a five or six minute routine. So with that question, I was wanting to turn his attention toward the next day. In other words, um, I wanted to first help him to focus on what worked, what was good. I wanted to, I called this phrase, I wanted to seal the day with strength. I didn't tell him that was the name, but that was what I was thinking. I wanted to seal the day with strength by asking him about the good stuff from the day. Then I wanted to turn his attention to the next day so that he would over time, which he did, start to see the connection between what I think and do today and what actually occurs tomorrow so he wouldn't grow up and be like so many people that, that kind of think everything's an accident or random. They don't see the cause and effect relationship. So I would do that and, and he would say things, in fact, I, like I wanna be the first to jump off the, uh, the, the high dive at the lake. Um, I want to read aloud in class. Um, I want to finish uh, in the top three in PE when we run around the track. Simple stuff like that. And then the third piece was what I called positive affirmation. And the positive affirmation was, uh, first of all, one that I put in the 4-8 principle, you're a beautiful, wonderful child of God. And I've said that over and over and over again, where all three of my boys will say that in their sleep. You're a beautiful, wonderful child of God. If you've, if you've read the 4-8 principle, you you'll, might remember that piece, but they would be sound asleep, and I would say, you are a beautiful, wonderful, and they would say, child of God. And I got it down to where it, I said, you are, and they would say, a beautiful, wonderful child of God. And I, I tried to first demonstrate this with Kristen, um, and I got so excited when I got them to repeat that aloud and I said, Kristen, come in. She walked across the hall and she was already kind of rolling her eyes at me. And I said, look at this, so cool. And I said, to, this was to Ty. And I said, you're a beautiful, wonderful child of, he had done it like five times in a row. And then when I bring her in to be my witness, he doesn't do it. It's like, you know, the toilet's running all day and you get the plumber there and then it, no, it's not running at all. And so I said, you are a beautiful. And she starts to walk out and he says it. And it was pretty impressive. And then I did it again. He said it again. And then a few years later, I did it with Mason. And then a bunch of years later, like eight years later, I did it with Brooks. And so I said, you're a beautiful, wonderful child of God. Mom and dad love you forever, always, no matter what. Actions have consequences. 
you make smart choices. Um, uh, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, and and so on and so on. So I have, if you want me to send those, there were I think there were uh, 21 of them. Um, just send me an email and I'll send you the list uh, that I sent. But I wasn't after, I've become a big fan of being patient um, in a lot of things, not in everything maybe, but in a lot of things, and particularly with parenting. You just... Uh, Timing is everything, and if you plant the right seeds, plant the right seeds, plant the right seeds, you may not always see the fruit immediately, but if you keep planting the right seeds, eventually it's going to bear fruit. And kids in particular, I think it's one of the things you shared with me, is teenagers are notorious for not giving you positive feedback. Like you're trying to connect with them, you're giving them some advice, and they're not giving you any love, meaning they're not acknowledging that you have any uh, intelligence at all um, or any life experience. But then lo and behold, those of you that have older kids know what I'm talking about. Later on in life, you'll see them making decisions and saying yes to things and no to things that, that you can trace back to the insight and the mentorship that you gave them um, in the past. So hope that was helpful. Round of applause if it was helpful. <laughs> and extra applause for Dr. Mark Crawford. Thank you. Thanks. I enjoyed being here with all of you. Thanks for coming out. Tommy Newberry back with you. Hope you enjoyed our special episode, our, our conversation about marriage with Dr. Mark Crawford. If you'd like to attend, and I hope you do, the Couples Planning Retreat, just go to couplesplanningretreat.com. It's pretty easy to remember, couplesplanningretreat.com. What I can promise you is a transformative weekend. You'll be intentional as a husband and wife. It will change your relationship. It will change your family life. Hope you can make it. As always, your marriage blesses others.